Now, by no means am I a sports guy. Like, I appreciate watching sporting events occasionally. I like playing sports, but I don't, I'm not really a fan or a follower of, of any teams, and so it's, now you kind of know why I'm weird. But in fact, if there's a, if there's a, um, there's lots of reasons, but if, if, you, if there's a, um, a game on in my house, like if there's a sports game on the TV, usually I'll just cheer for whoever Amy is cheering for. And I know that makes me a pansy, but we've been married 13 years and it's working, so it's all good. Where I'm getting at with this is that I might be a little late to the game on this, but f really for the first time ever, I, s I sat down to actually watch extended sections of the NFL draft this year. First time ever. And so as I was watching it, I, kinda, I already knew what it was about and what happened. But there's one thing about the NFL draft, that's where the uh, pro professional sports teams draft college players, you know, to become pro, pro players. And there's one thing about the draft that really struck me this year. Well, first year, the only time I've seen it. Uh, the, what struck me is how some of the college players showed up just hoping to get drafted. Now, what really struck me is that as, as I was watching this, you know, they've got the, kind of the holding tank area where these college players can come out. And by the way, you don't need to be at the actual event of the draft to be drafted. They can just call you and let you know you're on a team. But some college football players actually show up just hoping, expecting that they will be drafted. Some of them go to some great lengths. Some of them literally have to go to great lengths travel-wise to make it to this draft just because they hope they'll get drafted. So a lot of these players apparently spend a lot of money to get some nice clothes and some bling before they show up for this event. And even some college players end their college career early so that they are able to be drafted by professional teams. Now, what struck me about this, I'm not judging them, I'm kind of envious of the way that they're acting, what struck me is that they're really arranging their life around nothing more than a hope. Arranging their life around nothing more than the hope to be drafted. Now, you and I do this all the time. We arrange life around certain hopes that we have. Now, we've got, today is our focus, a lot of the eighth graders or younger people in the church. So you, when you're in high school, you know, you have to start deciding what you want to do for a for living because apparently living in your parents' basement isn't a job. So you, you have to figure out what you want to do with your life. And when you figure that out, then you have to settle in on a career path, like what school to go to, what major to get. And you really have to arrange your life around the hope that maybe you'll get the job you want someday. Or this will really hit eighth graders. So when you're in eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, you know, sometimes you have that crush at school. There's that boy, there's that girl that gets your attention. And so in the morning, the way you dress yourself is with him or her in mind. And the way, the way you do your hair, and then you put on your cologne or your, let's face it, Axe body spray, you know. And, and when you get to school, you don't just go straight to your locker, but you GPS a route that makes you go by her locker just so that she can smell what you're spraying. <laughs> you rearrange your life around certain hopes. Now, all of us do that. It's not the crush thing. If you're married, you shouldn't do that crush thing. Unless your crush is your wife, then just cheer for whoever she's cheering for, and you're good. And by the side note, men, you can cheer for participants on The Bachelor. Just saying. That can be your team, she, if she likes The Bachelor. Anyway, we all rearrange our life based on certain hopes. But not every hope should make you rearrange your life around it. See, there's this spectrum. While some hopes will, will lead you to rearrange your life, some hopes are on the opposite end of the spectrum. You rearrange that hope around your life. Like, you know what? Spring is here, and it's getting awfully nice weather. I hope it stays like this, but I'm not going to rearrange my dresser because of it. I will keep my sweatshirts. I will keep my winter coat available because today might happen. Right? It happened. It rained. It's cold. It's nasty. So you might hope for something, but you're not going to rearrange your life around it. You might hope that you get that job placement that you interviewed for, but you're also going to interview, interview for two or three others just in case. You hope for that job, but you're not going to rearrange your entire life around it. This is common sense. We understand that there's different levels of hopes. Some demand you to rearrange your life while others would be foolish and irresponsible to, ir to re rearrange your life around them. But what I believe is this, true of everyone in this room, 
We crave the hopes that rearrange our life. We crave that direction and that hope of a future because if you have that kind of a hope, it will change everything else about you. Let's say it the negative way. If you have a hope that doesn't change anything, that hope is really worth nothing. That hope is, worth, is, is really nothing more than some crazy wish that probably won't happen. If you like to take notes, number one on the sheet we handed out, hope really means nothing if it doesn't change something. Hope that doesn't change the way you view the world. Hope that doesn't change the way you view yourself. Hope that doesn't change the way you behave or what you pursue really isn't hope at all. But at the same time, we have to be careful with the hopes that we choose to rearrange our lives around. So here's the question I want to pose for the rest of our time together here today. You know this. You have hopes. You have hopes that you've downgraded and hopes that you've upgraded. But the question I want you to think about is this. What kind of a hope would your Father in heaven want you to rearrange your life around? If your Father in heaven would look at the hopes that you're holding right now, the hopes that maybe you've dismissed or even the hopes that, are, that you've made a big deal about, what would his take be on that? Maybe you're not a follower of, of Jesus. Maybe you're not a Christian. So you're just sitting back thinking, why in the world would I put my hope in some arrangement of documents known as the Bible? That's not exactly safe ground either. And what I want to show you today is an encounter that Jesus had that speaks to all of you. Maybe your hopes are in the right place. Maybe you need to be challenged to arrange your hopes differently. And maybe, maybe you just need a foundation for something to hope in. Throughout this series, we've been seeing Jesus appear after his resurrection, appear to a number of different people in different situations and different environments, but he gave them all the same thing. Hope. And the people that he's going to appear to today in Matthew chapter 28, these were people that had just had their hope ripped out of their lives. These were 11 men who had been arranging their life around a certain hope, and now that hope had died. And when Jesus appears to them, he's going to resettle and refocus for them what kind of a hope that their Father in heaven would really want them to have. And what you're going to find today is you're going to find some words from Jesus that may encourage you and may challenge you to think about what you've been hoping for and what might need to change. The section we're looking at is Matthew 28, and this happens after, like everything else in this series, after Jesus' resurrection. What had happened is before Jesus died, he told his 12 disciples, guys, we're, I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. I'm going to come back to life. And after I come back to life, we're going to meet in Galilee. And we're not sure how much of all that they understood, but we, we know they understood the meet in Galilee part. And Jesus knew guys forget calendar things. And so after Jesus rose from the dead, he told Mary, hey, Mary, go remind the guys we've got a meeting in Galilee coming up. And so Matthew chapter 28, this is where that meeting finally takes place. Jesus has risen. They've already seen him once or twice. But now here comes this formal meeting where Jesus needs to talk about the kind of hope that they have. So the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Now, just, just picture this. If you're in their shoes, you might have this spark of hope that maybe something could get better. Maybe something will change. But what they're going to walk away with and what you will walk away with is a kind of hope that changes everything. So they settle and they come up to this mountain. They're, they have to be wondering, what is it that he's going to show us? What is our plan going forward? And what can we hope for? So as they saw Jesus, verse 17, <clears throat> when they saw him, they did two things. They worshipped him, but some doubted. They worshipped, but some doubted. And there are books written, almost books written about this one verse, because how can you worship him, but then doubt him at the same time? And maybe to start with that worship thing, to worship him was, was expected. 
When you're in the presence of one who is holy and powerful and beyond anything you can understand, you acknowledge that they are greater than you. You are disqualified from being in their company. You worship them. And for the disciples, we don't know exactly what that looked like when they worshiped him. I really doubt they, they broke out a hymnal and started going through a worship service. I think what happened is they simply got down on their hands and their knees and they acknowledged who he was. You are greater than we are. You are the Son of God. You are the living one, the one who died and who is now alive. We don't deserve to be in your presence. And then comes the second part. Some of them doubted. And I, I was asking myself the question, if they were just in the presence of Jesus, what are they doubting? Well, they can't be doubting that he's alive because he's kind of right there. They can't really be doubting who he is because he just proved that through his resurrection. And so I looked up the, the word in the Greek that's used for doubt, and as it turns out, it's a really rare word that's not used very often. And while doubt is a fine translation of the word, there's actually a little flavor to it that you don't see in the English. The word is also used to refer to Peter. When they were on the lake, and things were choppy, and Jesus miraculously was walking towards his disciples on the water while they were in a boat. And Jesus said, don't worry, it's me. And Peter said, if it's you, Lord, tell me to walk to you and I will. And Jesus said, come on, walk over here. So J Peter, the guys can't believe this, Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking on the water. But then the Greek word comes in, Peter doubted. He didn't doubt that it was Jesus. He was walking on water. He knew it was Jesus out there. He wasn't doubting Jesus' power, but the Greek word for doubt kind of has this flavor of hesitate. It makes you kind of pause for a moment and say, wait, 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 what a minute, wait, wait a minute. And for Peter on the water, what made him hesitate was all the wind and the waves, and he was intimidated and scared, and he hesitated, and his hesitation made him sink. And for the disciples on this day, they hesitated. Because here they had built up this big hope, arranging their life around the idea that Jesus would become the king of Israel and rule over the people. But that wasn't going to happen. So they hesitated. What is going to happen? We're not sure. What is our place in this? For sure we can say two things. They worshipped and they doubted. And what that shows us is this. When they worshipped him, that, re that showed that they were disqualified to be in his presence. And when they doubted, that's a sign that they were underqualified to be of any service to him. We don't deserve to be with you, and we're underqualified to be of service to you. We don't know what to do here. What should we make of this? And this is where so many of us can find ourselves to this day. It doesn't take you very long after you, you know, if you're confirmed as an eighth grader and then you get into high school and college, it doesn't take you too long to realize that the things you memorized are kind of hard to make sense of sometimes. And for any adult, let's be honest, there can be phases, stages of life where it can be difficult and there's these feelings of doubt and there's this issue or these issues that we just try to make sense of but we can't. And in those moments, it's so easy to believe the idea that we're disqualified from being with God because we don't have faith in him enough or we're underqualified to serve him because, well, I'm not strong enough. I'll tell you what, as soon as the devil can get you to believe this, he's won a great battle. That's when you start to make your relationship with God about your ability to serve him or to match him. And those are two things that you are not qualified to do. I want to ask you this question just to get, to get you to think about it for a moment. Number two on your sheet, have you been living in a way? Have you been living your life like you are disqualified from God's presence or underqualified to be of his service? By nature, that is what we are. But by Christ, that's what you were. Here Jesus is standing face to face with 11 of his closest followers. Here they are acknowledging they're disqualified to be in front of him and underqualified to be of service to him. And you'll never believe what Jesus does for them. Apparently they're in the vicinity. They're maybe even distanced themselves a bit to reflect that they don't deserve to be in his presence. So here's what Jesus did for them. 
Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Translation, you are right to be on your hands and knees and worship me. This is something that Jesus had said many times before. All authority is mine. And here's maybe the first time where it had a bit of a different flavor. You see, Jesus had authority before to preach like no other people could preach. He had the authority to heal like no one else could heal. But now he was demonstrating an authority even over death. All authority has been given to me. Authority that's recognized by my Father in heaven and an authority that's been established here on earth. And because of this, here's what's going to happen. Therefore, go and make disciples. Because I am who I am, here's what you need to do. I have a plan for you. I have a hope for you, a God-sized hope that you will go and make disciples. And if you could just go through this in slow motion with those disciples, here's what they would have been thinking, you know, the 11. They would have been thinking, okay, cool, so like this is nice to know that you're alive and now we've got this amazing thing, you know, victory over death to share with people. Do you know how many years it took Jesus to make 12 disciples? It took three years to make 12. And even then, one of them left. And so that's why we're, we have 11 here. And so maybe they're thinking, okay, we've got 11 of us. If you do that, 11 times 11. I'm bad at math. I'm not even going to try. And, and so, sure, we could kind of multiply. We can make disciples. But then Jesus kind of taps the brakes. He says, I want you to make disciples of all nations, not just your friends and family, not just the Jews that you know, not just the tax collectors you're accompanied with. Go make disciples of all nations, everywhere. You have the world as your mission field. Go make disciples. And in this moment, if you were them, you would feel just like they were. Overwhelmed, underqualified, disqualified from being in the presence of someone this great. Jesus goes on, I'm going to give you two tools as you go make disciples of all nations. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus is saying, as you go and make disciples of people, you're going to find people who are disqualified from God's presence and underqualified to be of any service to him. But that doesn't matter anymore. All authority has been given to me, and I'm going to place my name on them. They will be my child. They will be born again into a new household, a new kingdom, and the blessings and benefits of this kingdom include an inheritance in heaven. Go baptize them into my household. And then he adds one more thing. And as you make disciples, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And here's where the rubber hits the road because for disciples back then and disciples to this day, being a disciple is not the easy route. Being a disciple is more than just standing up on a stage and declaring faith about God. Being a disciple means day by day you submit your life, your attitude, your desires, even your hopes to your Father in heaven. You grant him permission to analyze it all. And what you also have is a father who forgives it all. Being a disciple of Jesus means you are transformed by his love. And the lessons required to do that never end. And as Jesus is putting all this on the disciples, you're going to go to all nations and make disciples of all of them. You're going to baptize them and you're going to teach them. They had to be going through their mind like, we can't do this. And Jesus would have said, exactly. You are not qualified, but I am. So he carried up this great commission, this great command with an even greater promise that holds true to this day. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Surely I am with you always for as long as this earth continues until this earth reaches its finish line, I am with you. And for those disciples, that would have been their only strength because when Jesus gave them this hope, this mission of making disciples of all nations, it would cost them time, for sure. It would cost them their family schedules, absolutely. 
But for each one of these men, it would cost them much more. It would cost them their life. Perhaps only for John, it would cost him a life in prison. But Jesus gave them this promise, accompanied with this great command, surely I am with you always. And it was in that moment that Jesus would have made something apparently abundantly clear to them. He was telling them, hey, 11, we've been through some good times. You've had three years. It's basically seminary training that I just gave you guys. You're graduating, but you're not done. You're my disciples, but you still need discipling. You can't do this on your own. And if that was true of the 11, do you think it's also true of you? God has given you a great hope, purpose, to reflect his love in your life. And that's a complicated thing when you look at all the different areas and nooks and crannies and corners of your life. And his promise is even greater than that command. I am with you. I will be with you in all areas of life to forgive and to guide. This is what he made clear to his disciples. The disciples Jesus sent out to make disciples still needed discipling. The disciples sent out to make disciples still needed discipling. They still needed to learn. And if, if you don't believe me, just look in the book of Acts in the New Testament. It kind of shows you there how they went out and made disciples of all nations. They made mistakes. They had to learn. They had to be corrected by God himself. But that was a good thing. And it was a blessing because, get this, it was because Jesus gave them this new hope that they were mobilized to make the church what it is today. Good news has gone out into all creation because of the hope he gave to those 11. And I want to uh, quickly conclude here by, by asking you that question again. What would your Father in heaven have you hope for that you would arrange your life around? You can't hope for everything. You have to decide that some things are worth arranging life around <clears throat> and some things are not. But I'm going to ask you this, just to close. Imagine what would change if your hope was in the hope that Jesus started. Here's his hope that your sins are forgiven by God in heaven, that you have a perfect relationship with your Father in heaven, and that someday you will be resurrected to dwell with God in a very real way. If your hopes are placed there, and if you arranged your life around that hope, imagine what else might change in your life. For those 11, the change meant that faith was mobilized, hope was mobilized, and it spread throughout the world. And for you and for me, what we might find is simply this. We encounter situations in life where it's tough to navigate, but we lean back on that promise. Surely I am with you always. You are a disciple that still needs discipling. And you will until you get to meet that shepherd in heaven.